Um, well, good morning, and um, yeah, good to see some familiar faces, and um, some maybe I don't know. Um, so my name's David Price, and I'm going to be talking about something a little bit different and a little bit down the line of lab innovations, because it's an innovation from Perkin Alma, and I just want to share something about our single cell ICPMS. So my agenda, um, very simply, I would like to um, give an introduction. Um, I would like to tell you about what single cell ICPMS can offer. I'd like to tell you about how it works. And then I'm going to give a few different applications. So hopefully something to spark a little bit of interest in the audience. Um, so first of all, who is this David Price in front of you? Like I say, some familiar faces. Um, some don't know who I am. Um, so yes, I suppose I'm a, a nerdy chemist who gets into uh, ICPMS. Um, my background is um, educated from uh, the University of Liverpool. Um, and then I did a, a, so I did my degree there in something very, something very unbiological um, in marine chemistry, believe it or not. Um, and I carried on with that chemical oceanography field, um, doing a PhD at the University of Plymouth um, in collaboration with Plymouth Marine Laboratory. So two fine cities, very contrasting cities of Liverpool and Plymouth. So that was good. Um, and then I kind of had fantastic fun just doing a little bit of um, postdocing um, and doing a little bit of globe trotting, which was pretty awesome. Um, so I worked at um, a French marine research institute um, called Ifremer um, in France, and then did a short postdoc in Australia before spending a few years out um, in America doing, again, some chemical oceanography. I was actually employed by the, um, the US Navy at the time, believe it or not. I mean, I didn't have to wear the whites or anything, but uh, you know, it, was, it was good fun. It was a good entertaining one. Um, I then joined um, Anglian Water as a regional water and wastewater company, um, which I was there for about 12 years, actually, running a lab, busy lab, very similar to John's lab, I suppose, um, getting through an awful lot of regulatory samples um, and doing an awful lot of ICP-MS and ICP-OES. And then about six and a half years ago, um, I joined Perkin Elmer. Um, so my role at Perkin Elmer is quite a varied one. It gets me taking selfies from time to time, but it's working with customers to make sure that they can actually achieve good, meaningful data from their instruments. Um, it's kind of important. It takes me to some interesting places, so maybe into kind of a clean room environment, um, maybe ICPMSs in a little box like that. Um, uh, Regionally, I get to travel across UK, Ireland, also the Nordic countries as well. So it's quite a nice geographical area for me there. Um, good news is I'm not on my own. I've got a nice big team to work on and we work together to ensure that we're delivering the right solutions for our customers at Perkin Elmer. So my introduction done. Um, so what can single cell ICPMS um, offer? Well, here's a weird one. I'm not gonna put my hand up, but put your hand up if you're a cell biologist here. I'm not expecting much response, okay? So this has taken us into a bit of a different world, really. So if we think of it being a galaxy far, far away, we all like our bit of Star Wars theme. Well, maybe in this case, we're talking about a laboratory that's far away. So it's a bit different to what a lot of people that normally do ICPMS would normally be doing. Now, in this case here, what we might be talking about is actually somebody that's interested in finding out the element mass that's actually in an individual cell. This is really important information for people who are interested in cell biology. Now, in this case here, we might be talking about finding out which ones contain more. And here, the units are actually in atograms. So this is atograms of a particular element in a particular cell. It's crazy, crazy detection limits that we're talking about. They might also be interested in looking at lots of different cells and looking at that element mass distribution. So here we're actually getting information about taking a whole sort of cell culture, maybe taking in 50,000, 100,000 cells and actually looking at those and getting that information about how many of them are containing a lot of that element of interest and how many are containing not so much. Hasn't been done before. This is an innovation. Maybe looking at a specific element, in this case, titanium. Which cells contain titanium? Which cells don't contain titanium? Might also be something where you want to look at getting cells and actually treating them with something. So this is where it gets into some of these sort of drug delivery kind of aspects and saying which cells are taking up material and which cells are not. So in this case, we're saying, OK, the ones that are darker colored there are taking up more of the element of interest and the ones which are lighter are taking up less. Again, this information's not been obtainable before single cell ICPMS. We can also think about nanoparticle uptake. There's an awful lot of work going on with nanoparticles, whether it be for drug delivery mechanisms or even looking at it from a, an environmental ecotox perspective and saying, OK, we get our cells, we expose them to nanoparticles. Do they all take up the same amount or do they take up different amounts? 
So this technique can actually give us that. So we can find out which ones aren't taking any up. We're not going to see them. Which are taking up a signal, what well, gives us a small signal, say that that's appropriate to one nanoparticle, or it may be up to four, five, whatever it may be, whatever that cell is. So again, something a bit wacky and a little bit different. Um, so with regards to the sort of cells that we look at, we can look at virtually anything up to about that size of 100 micron. 100 micron where it starts to get tricky, but fortunately, virtually everything we want to look at is going to be fine at that scale. So we could be looking at yeast cells, human cells, plant cells. We've looked at bacteria. So there's a whole big scope of it. And it's really nice. It's a nice mix between, I suppose, that analytical chemistry world and then getting onto that verge of sort of, I suppose, biological inorganic chemistry and the kind of things that we can offer now. It's, um, it's a nice innovation. So just looking at some examples, um, it may well be those environmental ecotoxicologists actually want to know about what elements are actually being taken up into those cells. So that's one. Gets complex for a good chemist like myself, this just blows my mind. But the kind of things that go on with regards to the cell interactions about elements going in, elements coming out. But it's actually looking at those transport mechanisms and we can actually get to study these at a single cell level. Kind of mentioned it a bit earlier as well, just about this drug uptake. There's an awful lot of interest in sort of getting drugs at the kind of state where they're actually targeted and actually taking it to where it needs to be in the body and actually deploying that medicine at that point. So if I go and look at a little bit more detail and getting into something like the cancer and the drug research side of things, there's a whole range of different aspects here where this can be of interest. And I suppose what I want to talk when I get onto it is really just talking about some of the applications and what we've done there. So metal-based drugs, drug discovery and development, um, and the Center for Disease, and um, so this is more sort of in the States, the CDC. Um, CDC. Um, but if we take something like on the drug delivery side of things, we've got nanomedicine. It's a massive emerging field that we're taking about here. This is something where just on the master's courses, there's 15 of them now in the UK, and they're going up year on year. People are very, very interested in this targeted medicine. So I'm going to talk about a targeted drug delivery application just briefly to give you an example of what I've done in collaboration with the universities in the UK here. On environmental toxicology, um, there's a lot of interest in this. And this has been going, this is probably an area which has been developed the most. This is quite a new thing. It's in the last couple of years we've been going. Um, but this area is particularly interested because they've been getting a lot of bulk information, whereas now they can get it on a single cell basis. And quite an interesting one is on, um, on microplastics, which I think we all know is becoming more, a bit more of a big deal there. I know that you know, that's, that's something which is interesting to a lot of people. Um, and what you can actually do with this technique is actually think about if we're looking at uptake by phytoplankton, we can actually dose those phytoplankton with an elemental marker, and we can actually track them. So we can see where that's actually going. So in effect, we can actually track the microplastics using an elemental marker. It's pretty incredible. Um, I suppose just on the whole cellular science side of things as well, um, this gets people interested. Anybody that's studying those kind of cells, and that's interactions about what's going in and out. Um, and whether it be something like in, um, in biological sciences, uh, ionomics is a big field. This is basically that study of the elemental composition of an organism. Um, and so again, to check what's going in, what's coming out at that single cell level. So lots of different examples. OK. So going back to my agenda and, um, and how it works, I'm kind of going to back out a little bit, actually, and just think about this technique of inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry um, and what it's actually doing. I know some of you in the audience are very, very familiar with it. Some of you may be less so. Um, so really, we're talking about analyzing virtually the whole of the periodic table. Um, and in this case, what we do is that we are generating positively charged ions. So if we just take a simple example like copper, all we're going to do is knock out that electron, form copper plus, and we're going to be able to measure that. So how that happens on the inside of the instrument is that we generate our ions here. We take them through an interface where they're going into a vacuum. We turn them 90 degrees. We take them through, and we detect those ions um, as they go through. So that's our perkin elmer Nexian ICPMS. And anybody who actually wants to see one in the flesh, it's kind of just around the corner there. So uh, yeah, please go and have a look at that today. So this is the weirdest ICPMS you're ever going to see, and I can just turn on the plasma there. Um, this is just trying to give a diagrammatic idea of what goes on with this single cell ICPMS approach. So we have a cell suspension, and quite often we're talking about these being around 50,000, 100,000 cells per mil. It's actually a relatively low concentration of cells when people are studying the cells. 
And what we do is we take those into the plasma and we ionize them. So we create a little iron cloud. So in the case, this could be, I don't know, looking at platinum, let's say. We're just generating platinum ions and we see them as a little cluster, a little iron cloud going through. And that gets detected. So we measure, we have these dwell times, very, very short dwell times, where we're actually tracking that as it hits the detector. So it goes up, I should do it your way, it goes up, we track it, and it comes back down again. And what we can do then is we can actually measure the area of that. So if there was, say, a lot of platinum in that particular cell, it would be a big peak. If it's a small one, we see a small one. Fantastic, okay? And we keep doing this. We keep sort of throwing in lots and lots of cells, and we get lots and lots of information from it. And, and typical analysis time is probably about five minutes. Um, sample to sample, we acquire data for maybe about a minute. So what do you need um, to do this? Well, really importantly, and because you know my background now, I'm not a great biologist, but you need access to these cells and you need that experience of looking after them. So it's a really, really critical point because we want to look after ourselves. We're going to take them to a very sticky end in the end. They're going to go into a plasma. They're going to be no more. But before they get there, we want to make sure that they don't lice. We want all of that pocket of information going through. So. We definitely need a fast scanning ICPMS, and the Nexians are rather beautiful for that. Um, and we need that with our single cell module, which is just our software to be able to handle that analysis that we're going to carry out. We need a high efficiency nebulizer. For anybody that's doing any ICP technique right now, what it tends to be is just a nebulizer which is probably running around 200 to 300 microliters per minute. It's taking quite a bit of sample in there. We create that nice fine spray of solution and we analyze. And we just do steady state measurement. We analyze, we get good repeatability, good precision, and we do it. In this case, we want to take in very, very low flows and we want to make sure we don't have those cells lice on us. We want to look after them. So to do that, we have a special spray chamber. Uh, it's quite different to what's normally used in ICPOES and ICPMS. And it's a way to allow us to get that cell to go through into the plasma without it bursting. We also need an autosampler with syringes um, for low flow delivery, which is a little bit unusual. Normally, we use um, uh, a peristaltic pump Peri pump tubing, quite nice low cost kind of option just to sort of pump sample through there. In this case, we're actually going to use it syringe driven at flow rates of about 10 to 20 microliters per minute. So you can see that we're just working off a 96 well plate here. We're just picking up the sample. We're taking it through into a valve. Then we switch that valve, and then we take it through at 10 to 20 microliters per minute. OK? When it comes to the data, this is what you see. So you see this, these peaks that are coming out. Again, let's take the example of platinum. The large peaks are going to be cells that have gone through which higher higher concentration of platinum than those smaller ones. So we gather data there for maybe 30 seconds, for, for a minute or so. Um, and what we're doing then is we're actually building up information about what's high and what's low. So this is kind of what you end up with, where we could gather maybe 6 million data points. We're tracking an awful lot of peaks up and down, and we're integrating the area of each in individual of those measurements. It's crazy fast. We're going down to dwell times as short as 10 microseconds. Typical ICPMS, maybe 50, 25 milliseconds. So you can see we're a lot, lot lower. So we've got this information. What we then do is we put it into a histogram. So we're going to say, well, where's the big ones and where's the small ones? So here we go. The peak area down here, the small ones and the large ones. OK, so there's our histogram. And that would make sense with most natural systems is that we're going to get some sort of distribution. It may not be a Gaussian distribution. That one looks a bit more Gaussian. It, but it's basically going to give us that information about the low ones and the high ones. And what we do with these peak areas is because we've measured and calibrated and we've got something called transport efficiency, what we can do now is we can convert this into mass at the atogram level. 10 to the minus 18, it's pretty small mass, all right? I don't think you can find a balance that's going to do that for you. But in this case here, you can see it's centering around the kind of 1,000 atograms uh, sort of level that we're seeing. So this is what the software gives us. So we have the ICPMS, we have the software. It's all built into one area where you can do this work. So just going back to this whole thing about looking after our cells, our cells generally are pretty big. So if we have one which has got the sort of, it's 50 micron across, the water droplets that we'd normally analyze with ICPMS are tiny, OK? So the analogy here is kind of getting Dumbo to fly. He's a big guy, but he can fly, right? He's got big ears. He can make this happen, so it's OK. And that's kind of what we do with this system, is that we need to make sure we get those cells to fly. 
So we're using that high efficiency nebulizer, and this is the spray chamber that we use. So this is the ICPMS end. This is the sample going through. So we spray the sample down here, and we add in argon here, which gives us a nice kind of like a blow of argon around the outside of this spray chamber to ensure that our cells aren't going to bump into the side of it and lice. OK? All right. So what about some examples? I've kind of touched on a few of them, but I'll go through a little bit more detail on these. So just a few different examples of, of what we have. Um, so one on sort of cancer treatment. Um, cisplatin, lovely historical drug. It does a fantastic job. It's also quite brutal, but it's still something which is um, being studied an awful lot. And people are very, very interested in cisplatin uptake. Um, so this is work that's done with the National Institute of Health out in Bethesda in the States. And I've got lovely Lauren Amable there who's done, who did a lot of work with Perkin Elmer um, to get this happening. So I, I need to give her some credit. Um, so the thing which wasn't able before, which was actually to measure the platinum in individual cells. Historically, what would happen is cells would be treated with cisplatin to see if it's going in or not. They'd then be spun down into a pellet. That pellet would then be digested and give one result. And that would say, on average, that's how those cells behaved. But here we're talking about it on an individual cell basis. And this is biology. Cells don't behave in the same way. They're all li we're all a little bit different here today. These cells are all a little bit different too. So she found that cisplatin uptakes um, increases with time. Well, if it didn't, that would be a bit strange. But you're exposing cells, and if they didn't go up, that'd be a bit weird. Um, but also, she found confirmation that a resistant cell line, lo and behold, didn't take up as much platinum as the, um, as the less resistant one. She also did some serum starvation tests, which effectively putting them into stasis, um, and just sort of confirming that that um, uh, cell cycle wasn't responsible for any differences between the two different cell lines. And this is kind of just showing that thing that what we had before was just kind of like the one data. We really didn't know what was going on, one, one piece of information. Whereas, you know, it may be something where they're all taking up the same amount. There might be some taking up some, so, and maybe, you know, just, you know, what picture have we got? We just don't know before. We had one information from a spun down pellet of cells, and now we can get it on that single cell basis. OK. Um, so just thinking now about um, onto the ecotox side of things, um, this is some work that was done with um, the University of South Carolina. Um, he's, a, he's a Brit, actually, Jamie Lead out there. And looking here at some um, freshwater um, uh, algae, um, a lovely little flagellated algae, swimming plants. It's fantastic, isn't it? You know, these are out there. So this is Cyptomonas ovata, and about it's a very good organism to study to see actually are things going in, and are they then being available to the rest of the biota in that water course. Now, I've put this little diagram up here. It's probably a bit tricky to read. But this is something which has to be done for this work to work. If we're doing any exposure test, we want to make sure that we've got, we're studying the elements that have gone into the cell rather than onto the cell or in the actual media that we're studying. So there's successive wash stages. And the technique's really beautiful for this because we can do our wash and we can analyze that wash immediately and actually see if we've got the elements of interest in there. If it's in there, fine. Let's go through another wash cycle. So it's kind of resuspend cells, put additional wash in there, spin them down, and then analyze again. And is it coming down? And we can actually repeat that process till we know we're actually looking at element that's within the cell rather than element that's actually in the media or stuck to the cell. So really important level. So it was great news, able to look at a lot of different cells in one go, which is awesome. And for the first time, and this was, you can see it was published this year, for the first time actually looking at that cellular uptake of the gold nanoparticles. So gold nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles, they're out there in the, in the environment. What's, where are they actually going? So the Ecotox guys really want to know that. OK, um, another one just done in collaboration, not too far away from here, the University of Birmingham, um, looking at some lung cancer cells, um, so cell line A549. And um, I've got Benjamin up here because he's done some great work on it. He's a PhD student um, who's in collaboration with Perkin Elmer at the university there. Um, and he's been able to do some really pioneering work in pushing this on. Um, so with these lung cancer cells, one of the things he wanted to look at was looking at the intrinsic elements. We're not looking at element uptake. We're actually looking at what's actually in those cancer cells immediately. And there's a suite of elements that he wanted to have a look at. And the good news was there was clear presence of these elements of interest in those cells. Um, here's one for cobalt. And you can see again that the kind of mass range. We're talking about it. Yeah, it's centering around 36 atograms per cell. Crazy, crazy, crazy load of um, concentrations there. 
And the really good news is when he looked at the different elements, he was actually able to see reproducible cell concentration data. So it's not necessarily about how much is in each one. It's about the fact that like, we're seeing the, the cell, it's almost doing some flow cytometry. It's, kind of, it's counting the cells in a successful way. So that was really a nice sort of um, yeah, confirmation that the system's working well. OK, so returning to plants again, um, and this is in collaboration with the University of Nottingham. Um, and thale grass, which is a very commonly studied one, we can actually very quickly create protoplasts. So we actually have single protoplast ICPMS. So these are cells which have lost their cell wall, plant cell wall. And so they're nice little bubbles that we can analyze. And they go really beautifully into the ICPMS, and we can study those. So freshly prepared, it has to be freshly prepared. It's not something you could prepare protoplasts a week before and bring them along. It's done there in the lab and ready to go. And in this case, copper was of particular interest. So this is all linking in with the whole ionomic side of things. Um, but yeah, copper was of interest. And we got some great data. So this is just looking at a screenshot from the software um, of showing where we're calibrating and the kind of information we're getting from a single protoplast basis, and then looking at that histogram that we get out of it. OK. Um, the other one I want to mention is oh, this targeted drug delivery. And there's some really interesting work with King's College in London on this. So it's a lovely idea. This is that we're using single-walled carbon nanotubes, OK? And on the outside of them, so this is the cage of the, nanoparticle, uh, the um, carbon nanotube. And on the outside, we're going to put some gold nanoparticles. Now, these are really, really good for us, because what we can do is effectively build a corona around those nanoparticles, which means they will take that, that sort of material to where it needs to go in the body. So in this case, it was actually looking at putting in something which was going to cross the blood-brain barrier and actually take it towards it's for, for brain cancer and about sort of getting it to the right place. So the medicine in this case was a little bit of lutetium chloride. So the ICPMS can see the gold and it can see the lutetium. So in this case, it was looking at macrophage cells um, treated with these carbon nanotubes, which also had the gold and the lutetium. Okay, can monitor both of them using the technique. So it's really beautiful. And it was able to track the gold. It was able to track the lutetium. And here, it's also showing just how low we're getting down. So for that lutetium, we were seeing around, saying it was about six atograms of lutetium in individual cells that had been delivered with these carbon nanotubes within the macrophage cells. So again, just quite incredible kind of work that's going on. OK, uh, just mentioning further resources that we have. We've got, um, yeah, you just search for Perkin Elmer single cell. You're going to find more information on this. I'm more than happy to talk to anybody that's around about this as well. Um, we have a webcast coming up. Um, so on the 13th of November, I'm um, going to be explaining a little bit more about some of these applications um, and about how it works. Um, so yeah, hopefully it's just something a little bit different for you, really. Um, so my summary, um, we've uh, learned what single cell ICPMS has to offer. Um, learn how it works, and you've learned a little bit about the different applications that we're doing. So yeah, that's it from me. So uh, yeah, thank you. Cheers. I'm happy to take any questions. Yes. Well, I think uh, really, yeah, any cells that can't work on. I, I think really when we're just talking about the size side of things, but. As I showed earlier, as long as it's up to about 100 micron, that's OK. Otherwise, Dumbo is basically needing to take a diet. We need to get a little bit smaller Dumbo to make that work. Um, so no, I think as long as we can, what we want to do is measure the cells as single entities. So cells that don't clump too much are quite nice for us. Um, but in general, yeah, we can take anything through. And I think, actually, they don't even have to be cells. They can be small entities. So I was able to actually look at the carbon nanotubes themselves and actually spot the gold and lutetium in those. So without a cell, you know, so yeah. Haven't come across anything that we can't do yet. Yeah, yeah, good question. Thank you. Any other questions? No? OK, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Nice one.